Hello and welcome to my channel Polyglot Reading. I'm David and here I talk about books that I read in English, Italian, German, Yiddish or French. Today I would like to present you my top two books from January plus two other books that I enjoyed but did not like as much as the two top two books. Let's start with the book that I read in Italian. That's uh, um, L'Isola di Arturo um, by Elsa Morante. Um, the English title would be Arturo's Island. And this is a coming of age novel written by the Italian author Elsa Morante. She's considered to be one of the most important Italian authors of the 20th century. She is also known because she was the wife of another famous Italian author, Alberto Moravia. And for this novel that was published in 1957, she also won the most important and most prestigious uh, literature prize uh, in Italy, uh, the Premio Strega. This novel describes the development and character formation of a guy called Arturo Gerace from his boyhood into his early adolescent years. And the key topics of the novel are what are the consequences of the lack of parental love and the yearning for being noticed as, as a human being worth to be to, worth some emotion and uh, worth getting emotion and affection and the complications of the relationship between father and son and the role of nature as a sort of substitute for missing human relations. It's about jealousy, it's about disappointed love or impossible love. It also touches some topics that were, that were considered a taboo at that time, like homosexuality and also the impossibility of a romantic love relationship between stepson and stepmother. The protagonist, Arturo Gerace, grows up uh, as a motherless child and he lives in a neglected mansion or, or, or villa on the island of Procida, an Italian island. Arturo's father, um, Wilhelm Gerace, is of German origin and he's a very strange and extravagant person. He is absent almost uh, most of the year and he's traveling, nobody knows where and why. And still in Arturo's eyes, the father has the air of a hero and of infallibility. Um, but the reader quickly realizes that something is wrong with this man. Um, there are very many, there are many hints uh, that something is strange about the way that the father became the owner of the mansion where the family lives now. So he seems to have it inherited from an eccentric, misogynic old man who hated women and preferred to surround himself by a young man. And the way Wilhelm de Rache treated his first wife, the mother of Arturo, who died shortly after the birth of Arturo, and also how Wilhelm neglected his son Arturo in the first month after his mother's death. So he did not care at all about the newborn baby. We learned that Arturo only survived thanks to a servant of the family who fed him goat's milk. In the first part of the novel, Arturo's daily life is described in some detail. He likes to explore the island and the nature and, and the sea on his own little boat, uh, mostly alone because he doesn't like his peers nor other people in general, and he's only um, accompanied by his little dog. And this part of the novel is full of idyllic description of the island, its sandy beaches, its rocky coastline, the beauty of the sunset um, over the sea, and Arturo's adventures uh, when he is sailing in his little boat. On very rare occasions, so when the father is visiting the island, they go on excursions or hikes together and talk about lofty ideas, such as the greatness of the Gerace family or um, about the superior uh, or about the superiority of the father's rationalism and atheism above or over the 
um, superstition and, and, and backwardness of the other islanders. And it's these rare speeches that shape Arturo's very first ideas and give him the feeling of being taken seriously by his father. All this changes one day when his father returns to the island with a new wife, um, Nunziata. And Nunziata is a 16-year-old a Neapolitan girl, only two years older than Arturo, and it remains mysterious to, to the reader and also to, to Arturo um, why on earth the father decided to marry again, and especially this young girl. Um, Nunziata is very shy, uh, taciturn, and very much devoted to uh, Christianity and to her has a very strong belief. Her whole baggage consists mainly of pictures of Madonnas and of one pair of high heel shoes, which she never wears after her arrival on the island. And the way that Nunziata is treated by uh, um, Arturo's father, by her husband, is um, very disturbing. So. Even on, on the wedding day, he's treating her very badly. He talks about nocturnal ghosts in, in, in the house. And uh, also he's alluding in a very disturbing ways to uh, the physical events that are going to happen to Nunziata during uh, the wedding night. And above all, he lets her know in, in very clear words, very frankly, that he does not love her at all. So this is a very, very strange. And um, nevertheless, it seems that Nunziata adores her husband and she devotes herself without any hesitation to the role of a caring wife and a diligent housewife and um, also as, as, uh, as an affectionate stepmother for Arturo and Arturo is very confused by this change in family. He behaves very rudely um, towards his stepmother because he feels a strong animosity uh, towards her and he treats her in a haughty, hostile manner and, and frequently mocks at her. And the situation gets worse when he discovers that uh, Nunziata is, is pregnant and but at this time, he also begins to question his father's behavior and because Wilhelm is not at all interested in either his wife's conditions or in the unborn child. Instead, he just goes off for a journey uh, without caring when will be the, the date of birth or, or without uh, indicating when he will return. The night that Nunziata gives birth to her child is the novel's most important turning point. Only the two of them, Nunziata and Arturo, are at home when the labor begins. And at first, Arturo does not know what is happening, what's going on here. He is afraid, he is startled by Nunziata's struggling and her agonizing screams and then, when finally he runs wildly to wake up the island's uh, midwife, he suddenly realizes that he is actually very afraid that uh, Nunziata might die um, in this situation. And this is sort of a revelation to him, uh, which changes his entire behavior towards her. From that night on, a sort of friendship develops between uh, the two of them. And this friendship, however, becomes complicated because Arturo soon feels very jealous towards the newborn um, child, his stepbrother, who receives many caresses and kisses from Nunziata. And because of this jealousy, Arturo realizes that his feeling for Nunziata is actually a much stronger affection than just friendship. It is, it's real love. He has really fallen in love um, with Nunziata. And um, especially the kisses that his half-brother receives from Nunziata are a real torture for Arturo. Uh, due to his mother's early death and his father's very distant attitude, 
Arturo has never even received even a single kiss in his lifetime. And the desire to become kissed and caressed becomes almost an obsession for him. And he finally tries to kiss Nunziata in an almost violent act. And, and from there on, the disaster begins. So the attentive reader has already noticed that also Nunziata has fallen into some sort of love with Arturo without realizing it herself. But she is too devoted and too, too pious and too faithful to her husband to give in to the temptation of becoming Arturo's lover. And I will not tell you any more about this plot in order not to spoil um, any more. But I think you already have got an idea about the, the main motives and the human conflicts that the novel is about. Morante writes a style which is very rich in imaginary and it's, she's very good at capturing the atmosphere of both nature and landscapes and the inner life of her protagonists. And the language seems to be more rooted in the 19th century than in modernity, but without appearing in any way outdated or oddly old-fashioned. So this was my first um, book uh, by Elsa Morante and I, that I can recommend to all readers interested in novels about uh, psychological development and personal growth, um, even under very difficult and challenging conditions. Let's move on to the second book. This is a book that I actually read in English. It's um, the novel The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. And this novel is often described as a very sad story. And some readers um, refrain from re reading it because of this uh, sadness. And I agree that it has a sad ending, without doubt, but it would be inappropriate to reduce the novel to that. From my perspective, the novel is absolutely worth a read, uh, despite the sadness, because it touches on so many very important human questions and struggles. Um, the main topic of the novel is uh, the struggle of character versus circumstance. Um, but to be more precise, it shows in particular how an inappropriate education and the lack of good guidance of good examples can can ruin the life of people no matter how good were the intentions of the ones who were responsible for the education provided i think that this is also an accusation made by elliot um, um, to her towards her society at her time because at that time there was no general systematic education and schooling system. The compulsory education in England was only established in the 1880s, well after Eliot's death. The story uh, revolves around the upbringing and young adulthood of Maggie Tulliver and her brother Tom, both growing up in the watermill girl coat, uh, which is owned by her father, Mr. Tulliver. And Maggie and Tom are very different characters. Tom is a very practical and pragmatic boy who has a fixed set of, of clearly um, defined beliefs and principles on, on which to act and without much of uh, curiosity, spirituality or thirst for knowledge. And, but he is always very confident that his own assessment of, of any situation is absolutely right, if, if not the only possible uh, one that any reasonable person ought to agree to. And Maggie, on the other hand, is uh, much more driven by impulse um, and curiosity and her whimsies. Um, not very constant in, in her convictions and behavior, um, but, but very impulsive. And we see this nicely um, in, in the very first chapters of the, of the novel when both of them are very young, for example, uh, in one situation, Tom was away for a couple of weeks and upon his return, he has to learn that 
his rabbits have died because Maggie just had her, her head in the sky and had forgotten to feed them. And on another occasion, when Maggie is vexed about a comment that was made by some relative about her hair, she simply goes away and cuts them off with a pair of scissors, um, leaving absolutely aghast her mother and the visiting aunts, uh, some of them quite silly and pompous gossips. And uh, I will come back to Maggie and Tom later. And I think first uh, we need to say a few words about her father, Mr. Tulliver, who also pay, plays a key role in that novel. Mr. Tulliver is a very good-natured and soft-hearted man, up to a point where he endangers the economic well-being of his family by lending out money without sufficient security. And on the other hand, he can be very stubborn and insists on what he considers to be his rights. And so that at one point, against all warnings and all good advice, he starts a lawsuit against a neighbor and which he loses and which gets his whole family uh, really into trouble. Mr. Tulliver is very fond of Maggie at a very emotional level. His relation to Tom is of a more practical mind sort. He wants Tom to get a formal education, partly also for egoistic motives, because he thinks that a well-educated, well-trained Tom can be of help in the legal conflicts that Mr. Tulliver is, is willing to, to enter in. And despite his good intentions for Tom, Mr. Tulliver has no clue at all uh, what a good re education requires and, and should consist of. And so Tom is sent away to a clergyman, a parson, um, as a private teacher to get some education. And here Tom is treated with all sorts of utterly useless subjects, at least useless for, for Tom. Um, primarily the ancient Greek and Latin and the ancient poets and this is all well meant, um, but a, an utterly unsuitable education um, for him. And, and this really hardens his character. It is making him even more pragmatic and rational and also unforbearing against others, in particular towards his sister Maggie. And Maggie, on the other hand, she does not receive any formal education at all. So she's a sort of pet child of her, her father, but he doesn't care at all for her intellectual growth. Although she is definitely the one who is more interested in intellectual matters, in learning, which, uh, with a natural curiosity to explore and to understand her little part of the world and with a willingness to go beyond. Um, she is also more of a, a daydreamer wandering around. She's, charming and, and doing no harm to anybody. And incidentally, she comes across a, a piece of um, religious literature, Thomas Akempis' work, um, Imitation of Christ, which is a very pious medieval de devotional book that teaches humbleness and self-renunciation up to the extreme. And as she's reading this without any guidance, any spiritual guidance, she takes everything very literally and, and tries to apply it to her life. And due to her unstable character, she constantly wavers back and forth between harsh, impulsive action and excessively pious acts of, of, of humbleness and self-denial. The situation for the family and for Maggie and Tom changes drastically when Mr. Tulliver loses his lawsuit, um, his property, and also all his, his willpower to, to work. He is really smashed by this lost lawsuit. So Tom has to end his so-called education very abruptly and to start earning money to, in order to maintain the family. And, and this is a task that he is perfectly fit for given his pragmatic and very practical character. So he finally succeeds in um, making money and paying off all his father's debts and 
also reinstalling his father as, as a tenant of, of Dolcott Mill. Um, uh, the second level of complications that starts as soon as romantic affection and love are involved. There is a love story slowly unfolding between Maggie and a class companion of Tom, a boy called Philip, Philip Wakem, uh, a hunchback who is in love with Maggie, but as he happens to be the son of the lawyer who had fought the lawsuit against Mr. Tulliver, you may imagine that this will lead to a lot of trouble. Um, the plot further thickens when the fiancé of one of Maggie's cousins also sets his eye on Maggie and actually planning to escape with her to get secretly married. I won't tell you any more about the plot in order not to, to spoil it. Um, you will have to read it on your own. I just can repeat what I said at the beginning. Although this is admittedly a novel with a somewhat sad ending, it is a beautiful, beautiful study of character and fate and going deep into important topics such as how the education by teachers and by people that have a formative effect on you will also have a great impact on, on your formation of character and on, on your fate and, and what can go wrong um, if these are not the right people, they don't, people don't have the right upbringing of, of their own. The novel also has a lot of very humorous and, and witty scenes uh, where Elliot debunks the, the shallowness and bigotry and, and selfish, selfishness of some of the Tulliver's relatives, um, as in particular a, a bunch of aunts and uncles, all with their specific flaws and who are in general well-meaning, none of them is actually a bad person, but they all have their little character flaws and vanities and which Elliot manages to, to put on display in a gorgeously humorous uh, and a humoristic way. Not actually mocking at them, but you notice that the, she has some sort of sympathy and, and generous feeling towards these characters, but really putting on display the weaknesses in, in a very funny um, way. My absolute favorite scene and, and chapter is when, when all these relatives uh, gather um, in order to, to discuss how the Tulliver family can be helped after the failure of Mr. Tulliver's lawsuit. And where most of them, instead of coming up with some practical advice and acts of charity, they just use the opportunity to show off, to praise their own little virtues and achievements. and. They all claim to be willing to, to do the best they can. They are competing for the role of the, of the, of the most generous one. But if you read between the line, you'll notice all their hidden and selfish motives and, and the way they are contradicting themselves and revealing all their character flaws and vices. And this hilarious chapter alone makes the book worth um, reading. It really shows the narrative power and, and humor of George Eliot and her mastery in, in, in description of characters. You absolutely have to read this. Let's move on to two bonus books, which I will just mention shortly. I'm not going into the detail because they didn't strike me that as deeply as the two other ones did. The first one is uh, Showboat by Edna Ferber, a book that I brought, that I bought in my book hall in an antiquarian bookstore. I also made a video presenting all the books I bought there. You can find the link in the upper right corner and you might want to check it out. Um, this is a novel about a family running a showboat on the Mississippi rivers in the late 1800s. It was once a famous book and it had also been a basis for a very successful Broadway musical. I think it's well written, it's lightly and entertaining, but I think it has some flaws in the writing, in particular in the final quarter of the book, some minor flaws which prevent it from being considered great literature, at least according to my personal definition. But if you're looking for something entertaining and interesting about the Mississippi area in, in the late 1890s, you will enjoy it. The second book 
um, was a historical novel I read in German at Trenk by the German exile author Bruno Frank um, about the true life of a nobleman who had been once the favorite adjutant of the Prussian King Frederick the Great, but uh, who was severely punished because of some of his political movements and the fact that he had sort of a romantic affair or even a love affair with the king's sister. And again, this is a book from my January antiquarium bookstore hall. Um, I like the book, but I also have some difficulties with it. Um, so um, I'm going to read uh, some more novels by Bruno Frank. I will give me a second and third chance. And because German exile writers are one of my pet literary needs that I'm interested in. So maybe one day I will present more of Bruno Frank or um, even make a, a special video about Bruno Frank and other German exile authors. Okay, that's it about the books. Finally, uh, a little piece uh, of off-topic personal background. Uh, um, I currently have sort of a practical side project that eats a lot of my reading time, but gives me a lot of physical exercise, which is also good. I, this month I spent hours and hours digging in my garden uh, because I noticed that in some part of my garden, uh, the part was actually turning into a swamp. Uh, because uh, there is a 100-year-old drainage system in the garden to keep it sufficiently dry um, and the main drainage pipe seems to be clogged and this drainage system is about two meters below ground. So I had to dig some deep holes um, all by hand in order to locate the, the clogged pipe and, and, and fix it. Um, but I also found uh, some interesting things there. At about one meter depth I found this nice little a cup, a piece of, of china um, that was broken in two, um, but I managed to glue it and uh, yeah, I put it uh, as a piece of decoration into my bookshelves to remind me of this uh, nice uh, little practical side project in February. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please give me a like or subscribe to the channel, but above all, please write something in the comments. I would love to enter into a discussion with you about the books that I read this month. Hope to see you next time. Take care. Bye and ciao.